everyone. I have, an, I have an optical illusion for you. I'm speaking into a microphone, but it does not amplify my voice. Um, so we're recording the session today, so all of our speakers have to speak into the microphone to record it, but we have to speak loudly to reach everybody in the back there. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. With the logistics out of the way, um, I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, this is a this is an important conversation that Indiana has to figure out how to have. And so um, we have some fantastic uh, speakers and panelists gathered today to help us think about racial equity in the food system and in farming um, here in Indiana. So I'm, I'm going to get out of the way. Um, my name is Liz, and I'm with the Hoosier Young Farmers Coalition. And we're here to learn, and I think probably um, a lot of you are here to learn as well, um, from these fantastic um, women and men who are going to speak. So. We have with us um, Karen Washington and Vivian Muhammad and a whole cadre of folks from Manners at Purdue. And they're each going to present for about 15 minutes about their work um, around racial equity in the food system. And then we're going to have a panel discussion after that. And we're really eager to hear your questions um, and have a good conversation. Um, so Vivian is going to start us off. Um, and by way of introduction, I'll simply say you run Elephant Gardens and you're a leader in the Indiana Black Farmers uh, Co-op. and member <laughs> um, and um, we're really eager to learn from you Vivian so without further ado uh, optical illusion yeah. um, um, greetings to everyone uh, she's introduced me I'm Vivian Muhammad um, our garden that we run our urban garden is called the elephant gardens and for those who weren't in the last session that where I explained where the name came from. Um, elephants are herbivores, and so even though they have a big footprint, it's a very green footprint, and um, they are fiercely protective of their youth and loyal to their community. And so we thought that was a cool symbol to have for our urban garden, um, because one of our founding principles and goals that we're just now walking into this year was to really truly engage with the youth of the community so that one day they would literally be running the entire operation from greenhouse to farm stand. And that is our goal, that is what we're working on. The Indiana Black Farmers Co-op was a brainchild of really about um, four women that sat down and said, hey, if we're gonna have a presence at market, we need to help each other. We need to help each other grow food. Let's do some crop planting, let's share some seeds, let's do some things together. And then from there just kind of grew because all of our farms um, are located in um, food apartheid areas, <laughs> as Karen Washington would say, um, areas that are really just um, void of any uh, fresh produce. And yet we were going to market in places that had plenty of produce. Um, the distri distribution of our produce was mainly done, if it wasn't on site, when we went to market it was always in some other place and so we began to establish markets in our own areas where the problem is which made sense um <clears throat> that's pretty much where we are right now is just in growing more food number one uh if i could say and i think i could s safely speak for everybody that's working in our co-op or the, that our number one goal right now is to grow more food. Um, the need, the demand part of the supply demand thing is there. Um, we just have to have more food um, and lots of it and to do that we need more help, more soil, more seeds, more everything and volunteers to be able to service the need that already exists. With the closing of grocery stores recently, Kroger's, uh, before that Marsh, before that Double Eight, it really made a dire situation even that much more dire. So as I come today, um, I hope to just add um, a voice of perspective as to perhaps another way that we can work together to try to solve this problem and I think the key to that is really understanding the roots of the problem. And I think we've kind of danced around it and about it in conversations that I've been in across the city and not really um, drilled down honestly on 
how did these foods, how did this happen? Um, why is it still happening? And why is it that it just has, happens to be happening in predominantly black um, um, neighborhoods? And so being able to have this discussion is really refreshing for me because I think it allows us to all kind of put our thinking caps on and talk about this in a more honest way, maybe even a more direct way, so that we can find some sustainable solutions um, to our problems um, instead of band-aid solutions. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, believe it or not, stop talking and let the next person go. I don't think that works, so. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Karen Washington. I'm from the Boogie Down Bronx in New York City. I guess I'll be your keynote speaker tonight. Um, I guess I can tell you a little bit about myself. So I was a physical therapist for 37 and a half years. So I saw the relationship between my, my patients and uh, the food that they were eating. Um, I didn't have any farming or gardening background. Uh, I just one time when I moved to the Bronx, I had a backyard and I decided to put some seeds in the ground and start to grow food. And I always tell the story, it was a tomato that changed my world. But subsequently I've been um, learning so much about growing food in a food system in such a way that um, the question I have each and every day is why in the greatest country that we live in, we have hunger and poverty. And then looking at and then questioning the food system in such a way because we have a food system that's based on the haves and the have-nots. It's based on race, which people don't like to talk about. It's based on economics. It's based on demographics. And so when people talk about a food system that's fair and just, I question that. I question that. I question that coming here even to Indiana. Because the first thing when I talk about and I think about a food system, I'm thinking about who's participating in the food system. For example, I tell people in order for me to really understand a food system, I need to find out who's growing the food. So I live in New York State and the questions that I ask because I would go around various um, states and various communities and I would wonder where are the farmers that look like me. We had a farmer that looked like me, so I asked a question in New York State. So how many black farmers are there? So in New York State, there are 55,000 white farmers and 164 black farmers. Same here in Indiana. I want to know how many white farmers and how many black farmers, how many women farmers, because we have to start having this conversation about who is growing our food. If we're talking about a food system that is fair, equitable, just, a food system where everybody is saying that everybody should have access to that food, then we have to make sure that there is diversity and inclusion to the people that are growing that food. And we need to have that conversation about why in the greatest country in the world we have hunger and poverty. Why is it that I know for a fact that cheap and subsidized foods are going into urban areas and healthy and wealthy food are going into rich neighborhoods. And using the cold word urban. Urban meaning black, suburbs meaning white, but the thing about when you talk about poverty, poverty has no color. Because there are people in poor neighborhoods and people in, 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 in black neighborhoods. And so then how do we move this food system? Because let me tell y'all, I am sick and tired of people telling me and hearing the stories around hunger and poverty and hearing the stories about wealth and inequality. Because folks, we know what the problem is. You know what the problem is. You know what the problem is. What are we going to do to change it? What are we going to do? And there are a lot of folks in this audience that have no idea what that looks like. Could maybe even care less on what that looks like. But if we're going to talk about this new movement, especially young people, of a fair and just and equitable food system, we have to make sure that there is inclusion and diversity in the food system. And I'm talking about not tokenism, not getting a few people that look like me and say, here we got diversity, we got inclusion. Because in order to have diversity and inclusion, there has to be a power shift. 
right? You can't have people being diverse and inclusive and they ain't got no power because it's window dressing and tokenism. And so what are we going to do for the next generation? Because I'm 65 years of age, folks. The average age of a farmer is 58 years of age. So how are we going to groom the next group of farmers, the next group of farmers that should be diverse? Because how do we talk about the planets? I mean, how do we talk about the plants and the vegetables that are so diverse? But when you look at our food system and the farmers, they're not. And so hopefully we can start opening up this dialogue for solutions because everybody sitting here knows what the problem is. So then how do we come together as people, as this, hu as this human race to talk about what we're going to do to solve the problems? And that's why I am here. Thank you. That's really hard to follow, <laughs> no. but my name is Christine Charles. I study soil science at Purdue. I am the president of MANNERS, which stands for Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences. We are a um, professional national organization that encourages and promotes minorities moving in spaces that have historically and systemically removed them. So students and people who are minorities studying and pursuing agriculture as careers are members of our organization in order to find community and support and momentum in moving through those spaces. So our national organization has been doing this for several years. We have been doing this on our campus and as a um, chapter for several years as well. And we wanted to share with you in um, the ways in which we move to encourage people younger than us to move in those spaces and to enter agriculture and how we move and enter spaces in agriculture as well and give you tips on how you can open those spaces um, for us as we move through them. So I'd like to invite our members, our parliamentarian, our secretary, and grad student representative to further speak on that because it is um, a collection of us that work and move in those spaces. So thank you for your time. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Brandon Hunter. I'm a student at Purdue University. I'm majoring in biochemistry and nutrition sciences. Um, I am the parliamentarian for Manners, um, and I will be one of the, your presenters presenting. Uh. I'm Kenaisha Meeks. I'm the secretary for Manners, and I'll also be for, uh, the speaker for this presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ronald Smith. I'm a PhD student in agricultural and biological engineering and ecological science and engineering. And before we start our presentation and transition into the panel discussion, I want you guys to keep in the back of your mind the frame of looking at food production systems versus agricultural systems from the individual level, just the smallest farmer who just has a small plot here, all the way up to the policymaker that has to make decisions for everybody. And think about the fact that while we're looking at it completely from a food justice perspective, as far as trying to get healthy, nutritious food towards everybody with the least damage to the environment, that someone who has more complex decisions, under stress, and vested interests 
that they'll be holding to potentially or allegedly depending on who you ask may start to look at things as a jigsaw puzzle and you know how it is if you get a jigsaw puzzle you have a box you toss it over you don't see a complete picture so you're constantly searching for the simplest most reductive story and more often than not that's the thing that gets us into trouble because that's where ethics goes out of the window because if you don't view someone as a part of your human experience then you can't actually empathize with it so try to keep that in mind as we're giving our, present our presentation and transitioning into our family so i'm going to start so our presentation today is on expanding opportunities for underrepresented minorities in agriculture now historically agriculture in the u.s has been somewhat monotone to a degree some would say in indiana still is but in order to think about what we're doing, we really have to figure out what is agriculture, what do we actually think food is, and if we know what, have an idea, a unified, harmonic, social justice perspective idea of what food is, then we can actually think about what we want to do with food and who should have access to it. So we're also looking, we're going to talk about Purdue College of Agriculture and its role in facilitating other programs that are related to manners and manners itself, and what you guys can do to get involved, to kind of push us so we can push you and we can have that push and pull back and forth so we're greater than the sum of our parts. So overall, we look at agriculture as the science and art of it all. The thing that inspired you first when you, as a kid, you first saw a calf, you first saw a lamb, you first saw the peak of, of a green leaf poking through the ground, you know, that magic, the thing that you, that drives you every day to go beyond what you would normally do for yourself and for others. That science, that art, is driven by the story that we tell, the data that we generate, and as a result, pretty much the trajectory of all of our lives to raise the whole trajectory of humankind. That's what we're here for, that's what we're trying to do, to talk about the story of small farms. Now, the US food system can be reductively looked at as all the things that go into taking what we consider food and making it into something. Now, for some people, that track ends up becoming how we make food products. And depending on how you look at it from a food justice perspective, a food product versus food are two completely different things. They come with different limitations, and as a result, go into that same reductive story. It can become, how do I get this square thing from point A to point B to the most people in a way that pretty much a corporation is a person acts. And that's not the story of small farms. It's how do we get the best to the most people for the last after, the lead after, which pretty much is the engineering perspective that you have to try to add a humanistic perspective also so that you don't get lost in the process. And that's what happens a lot of times as you're going up vertically into the system. We get lost in the process and we don't talk about people. So Purdue College of Agriculture has 11 departments. We're pretty diverse. So, so Brandon's in biochemistry something that people don't typically associate with, far with farming and agriculture. Kanisha is an, an animal science. I'm an ag and biological engineer. We cover a pretty wide range, and this is the story of Purdue agriculture. We have several administrative departments, and these departments and the interdisciplinary program tie the connective tissue of what Purdue agriculture is trying to do to reach the most people, and that's why the Office of Multicultural Programs, right? and manners is trying to look at what we consider some of the main challenges in agriculture. We're looking at education and practice, not solely for people who just want to go to university. We're looking at people who want to go into business, people who want to work into gov government agencies and non-governmental organizations. So we split it into three major age cohorts, K-12, to college age, and those who are above college age. So just not people who are on college track, but people who are in those same age cohorts. And how do we leverage our efforts in the academic range, in our near community, and beyond Indiana to leverage the best for small farms and agriculture in general. We're looking at knowledge and access. What are the economic barriers to entry? And the things that cause people who are currently engaged in agriculture to be phased out, particularly a death in the family, you have to have a succession plan. These are the things that are actually causing land to be consolidated and corporatized and will probably be one of the major tensions going forward when it comes to who's able to participate in agriculture near cosmopolitan spaces, near population centers, and in rural centers where even 
places in the screen of Bahamas like Alaska. This is going to be a very serious battleground because land rights, you aren't able to grow. Then you pretty much have to wait and have somebody serve you. You have left people participate in the agricultural system and then you compound the same issues that they're constantly talking about. And discrimination, which is a whole topic, a whole year long disc <laughs> discussion by itself. So converting the challenges, um, converting the challenges to opportunities for growth. Um, so the opposite of multicultural program. So as a as a minority in the college of agriculture, um, a lot of my agricultural based classes, I'm the only African American, um, the only African American male for the most part. So the office of multicultural programs is kind of like my home base, um, where I can go if I need help if I need any type of just support, whether it be academically, personally, um, not only for me, but just, it's, it's just a kind of like a more diverse place for students like myself and other underrepresented minorities. Um, Purdue is a big campus, so um, it's very good for us to have a department that we can like go and have um, support from familiar faces and people who can kind of like empathize with some of the things that we as underrepresented, underrepresented minorities kind of face. So manners. Um, that's who me and Kanisha and Ron, we are standing here. We, um, we are a program that focuses on pre-professional development. We do a lot of community service. We do a lot of outreach. We get a lot of exposure with companies and industry. Um, we do a lot of different things of research. And it's not only with us on campus. We reach out to, um, we have like a junior manager chapter, so we get involved with students and, okay, I see you in the back. Okay, so we get involved with students um, in high school, get them exposed to agriculture. It, it would be great for them to come to Purdue, but just get them exposed to agriculture in general for them to just take that along with them um, post high school. Um, on campus, and as college students, again, campus outreach, community service, things like that. And then after or post um, college, whether it be um, working in industry with companies who, who we interact with on the campus level. Um, professional organizations, again, so we, we do a lot of things with different um, professional organizations, Cargill, ADM, um, Covance. Um, they send representatives to talk to us and for different events and things like that, for internships, for mixers, uh, just different things of that nature. Programming, public outreach, celebrating existing talents, university, community um, partnerships, K-12. through So we. I've spoken a lot about those things already, but we do other things. So we partner with a local soup kitchen in Lafayette. Uh, so we do that normally on Martin Luther King Day. We do, we've done things where we've taken water to Flint. We've done uh, different things to where we don't just focus on Indiana. We don't focus on just West Lafayette. We focus on providing help and assistance to the, really the people who we see that need it. Um, it's one thing to, to just say, I'm gonna help you and not really giving somebody what they need. It's different whenever you see a, a problem and you ask somebody, how can I help you? It's more like that's 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 kind of how we operate. Instead of just us just giving what we think you need, we ask you what you need so we can effectively give and volunteer our time and our talents to you. So climate monitoring, education training, um, we are we do try to be environmentally friendly. Uh, we do a lot of uh, different things in regards to how to make things sustainable and looking to like research and other practices of that nature. So, uh, College of Agriculture, again, Office of Multicultural Program, is to assist the, the strategic goals and be more inclusive and diverse for facilitating programs um, and policies that promote social justice and enhance cultural competence for students, faculty, staff and administration and alumni. So it's, it's kind of, uh, OMP is kind of the, the bridge in between myself and deans. A lot of college students don't, will most, most likely won't ever get a chance to sit down with a dean, go to a dean's house, be able to know, know their dean's name for the most part. And so with me being in manners, with me um, having a nice connection to the Office of Multicultural Programs, I'm able to meet deans, provosts, associate deans, all, to all these people in higher positions who 
the average college student would never see and typically won't think about. So that's how we that's how we get the exposure for greater opportunities for bettering ourselves. So manners, minorities in agriculture, natural resources, and related sciences. We are a national organization, so we do things on local level, regional level, and ultimately the national level. Um, we also offer students opportunities to enhance leadership and organizational and public speaking skills to experience professional critique of scholarly work. So that's I'm I'm a I'm a representation of that right now. Just just doing that. So manners manners is definitely uh, a nice work uh, fun work life balance. So it's a lot of pre professional work, but we also have a lot of fun. Whether it be giving back during a football cleanup or volunteering to help with the local. Um, like soup kitchen, or clothing drive, food drive, things of that nature. Okay, for outreach, like like he said, we have a junior manners um, part of us and. The junior manners basically does the same thing that we do, but they do it for high school level kids. So most, all of these pictures are from the symposium, which is essentially a contest. Have you ever like had a speech contest or something? Basically, that's what they did. They all basically found their own research. They did their own research and presented their own research topics at a college level, basically. And through that, they are they were then judged and then determined who could go to national city and present their research at a college level symposium. So we do that as our we our outreach for the younger the youth of the of West Lafayette, of not West Lafayette because it's in Gary, Indiana. Sorry. For our home base, we have we start off with Boiler Fest. It's essentially for most freshmen when they come in, that's the first thing that you'll no, mostly know about. And we host well we don't host. We participate on just a normal day, come out and we tell you everything that we have to do, we are about and everything. So if you know us, that we're your first friendly face, hopefully that you see, that may look like you, may not look like you, may have the same understanding that you have, whatever the case may be. Um, our ice cream social, the ice cream social that the College of Agriculture hosts is for all the everyone in the College of Agriculture and we all participate and come out. So we'll come out and put, uh, have different top ice cream toppings so we had Oreos, I believe, and we just talk about things that we do, hopefully get you engaged to be better understand who we are, get our face out there so then you are able to understand us while also having a nice little treat. The MLK week with St. Anne's, we packaged soups, hand, handed out um, whatever food necessities that they needed, the people in West Lafayette needed during the day. We also we also um, interact with a lot of companies. So we interact with Cargill. We interact with our faculty and um, faculty because that's the best one I got. We interact with everyone that we can interact with to better engage the students at, our at the college level with everyone that is a part of Purdue. So you so we know who they are. They know who, they know who we are. We know who to get in contact with with any research that we want to do. He does. Brandon does his hair products and shoe service. So. If he ever needs anyone to talk to, he has the opportunity to go to and talk to those people. If I want re any research, I know who to go to and who to contact. To, who to contact. We also have our national conference, which is the college level symposium, basically, and we compete and show off our best assets to whoever we can show our best assets off to. In our community service, we go to junior, the junior manners. We also have. Um, Highway cleanups, we clean up half of the highway one semester and the other half of the highway the next semester. And we have football cleanups, which are, we clean the football stadium after every home game. And most organizations do that as well. And the best way to get involved with the youth in any way, if you want to build your company, build whatever brand you're supporting, or just build yourself in all honesty, would be to use social media or you can participate in any programs, get better funding, have those people, some people in intern at your location as well. It can be volunteer or paid. I'm pretty sure most people are fine with either one, but you know, paid is paid. Is paid. Let's go. 
But then most of us, what we do, we have social media. It's a better way because, you know, all the younger generation, we're all ticky and want to be on our phones. So we have our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to better get our face out there to apply to different generations. So we feel like more people, the older generations are now gravitating towards Facebook while the younger generation is more Instagram. So we try to appeal to everyone in the best way we can. <laughs> Okay, so what can you do? You can pursue your own best interests, like she just said, and try to enlarge your business footprint. Get out on social media. Try to go where the people are. Because, you know, I think what's this, Generation Z now? Z, which I think is going to be the biggest generation in the U.S. ever. So if you can get 1%, 1% of 300 million, what, 3 million? It's doing pretty good. So, you want to enlarge your business footprint, open up your business. Now, there are physical tours, which are great, but we're now starting to explore the concept of virtual tours. There are Skypes, there are camera phones, even virtual reality. And Facebook and Twitter do, I mean, they approach it probably from an addiction perspective. We're trying to approach it from an introduction perspective. The earlier you introduce, the greater the likelihood that even if it doesn't take right now, later downstream, you're going to have those impacts. So go and get the kids as quickly as you can. They want to see green things. We usually function very well when we see green spaces, we smell fresh air. Even though some people seem like they don't like clean water, fresh air and clean water is the best. So go on social media, try to open up your businesses to these virtual tours as much as you can. The more interactive, the better. Visit elementary schools, please. High school is too late. Like we try to do what we can, but once you get past sixth, seventh grade, you're kind of mitigating and doing damage control. You want to be able to have an intensive, interactive, proactive relationship with people going forward. This is the largest generation, so they're out there. They're hungry for, for someone to touch them and help them guide their creativity and to come out and explore as well. Do what you can. You can sponsor local trips if that's possible, or at least try to facilitate local trips to local farms and ranches. Purdue Extension is in every county in Indiana that I know of. Most people who I've met from Extension are very happy to have any help that they can, so please plug for Purdue Extension. Help them as much as they can. They're there to help us. And share. Share your story. Never stop sharing your story. Every day, all the time, people love to hear good stories. There's enough bad stories around. You guys are doing the work. We're here early on a Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We're out here trying to do the best for small farms, for Indiana agriculture, and for the food system in general. So share your story as much as you can. The more, the better. So in review, things remember. Agriculture does not stop at the farm gate. The more you put in, the more you get out. Small farms are important. Small farms are important. Small farms are important. I'll click my heels three times and say they're important. And Purdue College of Agriculture is doing its best. It's not perfect, but they're doing their best. We're trying to reach out to everyone as much as possible. We need your help. We need your help. Everything helps. Your time, your money, your energy, your experience, your stories. So please, help us out. And thank you for coming to our presentation. We look forward to your questions and comments during the panel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you guys all um, for really useful panels. I, I, um, I, have, I have a whole list of questions that I can ask, but I would rather let you guys ask questions. So. Yes, well, the first, the qu first question I was going to ask was um, to, to Vivian. So Karen's question was um, one that we think Vivian had the answer to. So be ready with your question. I'm going to ask one, and then we're turning it over to you. Okay. At lunch, Karen, you said, and, and I think during your talk, too, here, you said, how many black farmers are there in Indiana? And Vivian, you said um, maybe you, you know, so let's, I, I want to know. 
the um, data that I've looked at um, that was circulated by Emily Toner last year said in Indianapolis there was 98% white farmers um, and statewide 99% um, white farmers. So blacks are on the other side of that number <laughs> if we're dealing with 100%. Uh, so 2%, 1% um, is about the now, as far as that, how that translates into actual numbers, like how many farmers are in the Indiana, maybe there's someone in the audience that can give that information and we can work backwards with the map. I'm not, I'm not sure. That's about, yeah, the statistic is about the same for women, too, if you want to look at women farmers. I mean, to my knowledge, the best statistic we have is the National Agricultural Census that the USDA does, which has its own problems about who is actually responding to that. But if you look at that data for Indiana, women are less than 2%. It's like 1.4% for the community that's actually being censused in those. Okay, so um, I think someone said it earlier that uh, this is a neat space for talking about solutions then, right? If we, if we know that um, if we know the problems are here and that we're dancing around the issue of race in, in the food system, how do we get to the solutions? How do we move beyond that? Um, so that's what we were hoping we could do with the conversation today. Um, so who wants to start us off with a question? You're the one. Okay, great. Uh, so I, I might want to jump ahead of that just a little bit and then maybe work back. But what would a just food system look like to you guys? Uh, anybody can answer that. And But maybe with Karen because you were asking a lot of good questions. So when I, talk, when I talk about a just food system, I try to put it back to the people that have privilege and power because we know as people of color what a just food system looks like it's the people who have the power and privilege that's the question they need to ask themselves time and time again you know for years people would always come into my neighborhood wanting to know so when so you run a farmer's market and you grow food so what happens to people in the winter time and so the same thing happens to you in the winter time he goes to the store and so you know so this idea of what poverty looks like is it, for me that lens had to change that lens had to change because I no longer look at my low income na neighborhood in terms of the poor despair hopelessness because I live in a community there is no resources but people are strong and vibrant and they make something out of nothing and so that sort of narrative about poor and weak is wrong. It's strong. And so when I talk about a just food system, I want people who have power and privilege to turn it and, and, and talk about what that means to them. Because a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people with privilege and power don't even understand what that means, a just food system. I know what it means, but those people that need with the power and privilege they need to sort of um, answer that question. One thing I just want to want to add another thing is that we talk about solutions. So I live in a low income neighborhood because you don't said it was low income. And so I talk about this sort of charity system whereby when people need food, it's like go to the nearest food pantries and soup kitchen. Now, listen to me. They're the best things. They're the best things, but like what Ms. Muhammad was saying, and I'm saying is that they become people's way of living. And so for me, in order to flip that, I tell people, you have to come into my neighborhood now with regards to income equality, financial literacy, how to save, how to invest, how to own a job, own a business, because that's language that's not mentioned not spoken into low-income low neighborhoods. So if you want solutions, then give us the tools and the powers to talk about how do we now 
start investing in our community? How do we now start saving in our community, investing in terms of social capital? Because we don't want to replicate the capitalistic system that extracts. We want to be able to teach people how to invest money that stays into their community. How do they own businesses? Because the G word is right behind us, that G word gentrification. And so in order to stop that, we have to think about how do we change the narrative of putting more income and more finances in these neighborhoods so that it can be self-sufficient and self-reliant. Think about it. It's scary because I'll talk about it tonight. I'm just going to give you a little preview. Is that it's the P-O-W-E-R. Imagine people of color working side by side with you, making the same amount of money, living in the same neighborhoods. All of a sudden, it's that, whoo, that shift. So solution is come into my neighborhood with, and, and not with a hand out, but a hands in of financial literacy, economic development, entrepreneurship, and owning businesses. And you see a community that once was deemed powerless become powerful. You know, I had to look a few things up on my phone to answer the question. I, as I was reflecting on this whole conversation and this whole narrative, it kind of, was a part of me that laughed like, this is so crazy that the people that were brought over here, or the ancestors of people that were, our, my ancestors were brought over here to work the land <laughs> and built this whole country based off of agriculture and now we're sitting up here in a in this flip-flop of a world where we're talking about how to give justice and and making more black farmers and it's just kind of odd but then when you think about some of the things in history that make this a reality it doesn't how many of you are familiar with the homestead act okay somebody just anybody i don't want to do all talking who can like just tell me what what it is to your knowledge. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 1862, right? Or something like that. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. That's um, actual. Um, so it's, it was the land distribution. It was encouraged uh, so settlements in western part of the country, and land was just given away, 160 acres worth of land per family, criteria being that you um, would stay on the land at least five years. Uh, I read something where they said the free slaves were also um, open to get this land. I don't know how you can be a freed slave, but that's a whole other, another oxymoron right there. But still, the idea that, you know, you could get this land, 1862, most blacks weren't freed. Um, um, and so that meant that this was really a redistribution of wealth. Martin Luther King talked about that as well. Does anybody know 40 acres and a mule? 40. Okay. Somebody, yes, sir. exactly what happened yes so I bring those two things up in answer to your question about we know what justice looks like reverse the madness you know um, put power and 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 see where there's a will there's a way because when they wanted to give land <laughs> that they didn't own 
to someone else, they were able to do that. Um, and they did do that. And um, when there was a will to do the 40 acres and a mule, and then that got rescinded, General Secumsey's um, right rule or something act, and this was only fair, they're freed, but they have nothing. Let's give them something to start with. It's practical and makes sense. But then that land ended up going back to the um, white southerners from whom the land was supposed to have been allocated. Now the right or wrong of that isn't really what I'm talking about so much as the underlying principle of making a way for something to happen, right? Um, this will to make sure that people had 160 acres and they also got um, equipment as well. Um, and the will or the concept of the will to give 40 acres in the mule got rescinded. So I'm saying all that to say that the idea of redistribution is not, you know, which people want to call socialist. And well, well, we've been doing socialist stuff all along. That's what corporate welfare is. I mean, <laughs> that's what Dom Donald Trump lives off of and why he's a millionaire. Um, and I'm not hating on Donald Trump. I'm merely saying that a lot of the policies of the government of the United States that are in support of corporations are why part and parcel to the fact that he has built a lot of his wealth. Um, loopholes and the ability to dance through tax laws that uh, the average person cannot. And the knowing how to build your, your wealth through the corporate uh, welfare system that does exist. So it's kind of, so when we talk about this, to me it looks like what people would term as reparations. And that sounds like a horrible thing to most people because they say, well, it's not my fault. I wasn't there. I didn't live back then. You know, I, might, I, I, I haven't been a slave owner and, and I haven't been a slave, right? At least not literally. And that's fair and that's true. However, when we're talking about justice, justice has to look at the whole picture and justice has to take into account how did we get here in the first place? Everybody, we can't start from like right now. That may sound nice, but we have to address how this all came to be. How is it that a whole race of people ended up over here against their will, were made to work for free for almost 400 years, and then left out and said, okay, you're free now. Um, most lynchings, by the way, were uh, many lynchings, not most, but many were economically, um, uh, uh, motivated to scare black farmers off their land um, and to punish success. Um, one black farmer got um, lynched because he dared ask a white man for a receipt. Um, and that's just something you couldn't do. You could not question or what do you mean receipt? And what it was really about wasn't even that. He was a, a successful black farmer. Many people talk about Reconstruction, they don't understand that period from 1865 to the great compromise that took place. In that period, we were extremely successful. Um, but then that's when the retaliatory actions began. Ku Klux Klan, you know, the whole nine yards, black laws. And then that's when the whole divestment took place and we were scared up north, driven up north. Um, and so I'm on, only saying that not, it's, it's not about a guilt trip or to try to make, pull, hold a race card. It is, it is just how we got here. We have to have intelligent, dispassionate, calm conversations about the processes and the policies that got us to where we are. I'm skipping over a whole lot of it because that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about solutions. But in answer to your question, I really don't think we can get to a full solution if we're not willing to at least talk about how we got here. And, and, and we have to, you know, and that can be, it doesn't have to be uncomfortable if we're all just willing to calmly sit and talk about it and we all, you know, are looking at this from a, and nobody's trying to throw guilt on somebody else, it, but we just have to look at it, right? And we have to say, hey, this did happen and this is part of why this construct is as lopsided as it is right now. Part of it is because of the divestment of an entire race and the allocation of land to others 
it's about that that did happen and that's part of why we're like this to get to that justice what i think should happen is that there should be help given in the form of helping to cultivate uh, um, more black farmers i think we need some more um instead of all of these um schools of um we need schools of agriculture on ed elementary levels and high school levels we need a whole high school of agriculture the same way you have all of these other types of um, schools we need one devoted to agriculture from elementary forward in the inner cities that can cultivate the understanding of what they're learning now in college through manners we need we need those good manners <laughs> down here um, and to really cultivate a different mindset it's what most of the farmers, uh, Shalana Moore, Taisha, and others that are ha are working with youth programs are trying to do is to cultivate this whole new generation of black farmers. Uh, we just need help. We need help. It tends to be that the same dollars go to the same people. I said at the table, that's not their fault. It's, it's, it's policy. It's how the grants are written. It's the language. It's the barriers that are put up in the language. So all of that has to change. And so if we do that, then we might be able to get at that, you know. Um, and I think that's what has to happen. We have to be intentional with the dollars and, and purposeful with them I'm not, and putting them where it will really do the most good. I am not talking handout mentality, but a helping hand, yeah. But just to give me some handout mentality is what we got now with, you know, everything's a directed towards a food pantry, soup kitchen type. And, and again, like she said, that's not bad. I'm not, you know, we have to have that. If we didn't have that, there'd be a lot more of a problem. But I'm saying as far as a sustainable solution, one that, that then we're, we have to start talking about job creation. And these, these children are brilliant. They can create their own jobs, give them the tools, give them the know-how, let them become job creators themselves. And so that type of um, intentional, purposeful use of dollars needs to happen. And I just brought up the, the whole will, where there's a will, there's a way. Part of it is because we will hear, well, there's not enough dollars for that. Well, the money, where are we going to find that kind of money? You find money for what you want. Now, we've seen that with on a local and on a, on a state and on a federal level. We find money for what we want. And so... I'm just saying reallocate a little bit of that money. You know, if you can find money for a wall, Trump, find some money for some gardens in the inner city. You know, that's my opinion. And I'm I think I might want that on a t-shirt. Um, Ron, it looked like you wanted to maybe talk about cultivating that next generation. Okay, okay. Go for it. So, a just food system. I think we probably suffer from a, a lack of imagination and creativity. I think we probably have reached the limit of our creativity when it comes to the food system based on what we are accustomed to just as human beings. So I would ask the other question, or what I think is the underlying question. Who do you think human beings are as a whole without suffering? Like how do you define, because fundamentally, that's how we define us, how we've defined ourselves for the last couple thousand years. Your ability, to, what drives you to get up out of your bed? Your hungry stomach or whatever it is. And who are we, who are you individually without that drive? And who are human beings as a group without suffering? Because we, we kind of discussed this a little earlier. Would the world genuinely be a better place if everybody had access to fresh, nutritious food or would we actually just find more creative ways to be destructive because we didn't address the root cause of what do we do without suffering because fresh, nutritious food overall from an administrative purpose doesn't have any value if there's not the potential for somebody to starve or to eat unhealthy food. Like that's what our actual relationship to food and each other is. It's an unspoken competition which Work fine when there's like 10,000 people spread out all over the place. But if you're bumping into each other every time and looking for the simplest story about someone who's different, 
then if there's 10 apples and I only re really need a half, I'm still going to hoard five because there's a potential for me to starve and for mine to starve, even though I know that there's going to be 10 more apples tomorrow. So what do you do? I mean, so if our suffering is what defines us, what gets us to do things, what drives us to be who we are and relate to who we relate to, then the most fundamental thing that we do, which is eating and trying to get something to eat, is overladen with that same struggle. So as a result, if I don't have, then you do. If I do, you have to starve. So for me to feel good about myself, fundamentally, somebody has to starve. It may not be the people in this room, but it's someone down the street. So I would say, if you can determine between just where you're navigating human suffering, you're suffering to one person and everybody, versus fear, which is what administrators talk about, access to equal opportunity or the, the chance for equal access, which actually is an equal opportunity. It's still something that more downstream. Now, if you discern between those and say, okay, justice, we want, we want to reduce human suffering. We want everybody to have the ability to maximize their whole human potential so we all are better. Then I would say, if energy was cheap, yeah, but energy is not cheap. It isn't close to cheap right now, actually. Because even if you say, I'm going to charge you what water actually costs, what fresh water actually costs, or should cost, then it's not going to work. If you don't have cheap energy, then you need cheap labor, which is what every major empire, because the U.S. is simultaneously the greatest empire in the last 10,000 years, and the greatest democratic republic also at the same time. If you don't have cheap labor, then it doesn't exist. So that's what I would say a just system looks like. One has, it has cheap energy or, you know, somehow navigates what labor is. And in 20, 30 years, we'll actually get the chance to see because most people are going to be out of a job. So the experiment's already started. So I say, think about that. What do you think human suffering is? And should it be alleviated? If you can answer that for yourself, for someone who you don't know, then you can figure out what a just food system looks like. That's my short answer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, question in the back there. So in the, um, in the work I do, we start with the question, what does it look like when we have succeeded? That's, that's the first question we ask. So if we don't know what it looks like when we succeeded, then how are you supposed to build the pathway? So in Guatemala, we say, when you don't know where you're going, every bus takes you there. And it seems to me that in the urban, rural, minority you know, struggle, we are taking any bus that comes by because we fundamentally don't know what the destination looks like. We can theorize. We have a lot of science and sociology and anthropology to theorize and history to theorize. We know where things came from, but where are we going? So one thing we did was quantify it. And what we came up with was for us, the Hispanic community, we need and we can as soon as we can access land, we can actually deploy the one thing that is common to all of us, which is poultry, meat, and eggs. That we can start with. And then we design a system, engineer a whole process for what it's going to look like. And then we calculated what would it be fair and just for us to manage as part of that system. We came up with 5% of the total market share, even though it's not yet just because we are way more than 5% of the total population. But I think we should think of, as in percentage of the population, who we are and how much percentage of the wealth and all the movement and the supply chain and the access and all of that do we have as a result of it. But not for somebody else to come and invest in us doing it. That We can do that ourselves and we know how to do that. And so once we quantify that, we realize, okay, that will be $3 billion and 2.694 million acres. 
now we can we know where we're going. So then, five years ago, we started to build the bridges across all of the lakes and puddles and potholes that are in front of us, which we call barriers. But once you know the destination, you know where to put the bridges, and you know to lift them so that others can come behind you. That is what it looks to us in a one specific sector. Now, we've got to do the same for all of the other sectors. And what we found out was that as we do that in the rural communities, all we have to do now is bridge, build another bridge to the urban communities, and now we have access to highly nutritious food, very affordable, because we are not necessarily buying food. We own it. We control it. And when you own it, control it, it isn't expensive to feed yourself high-quality food. That's my answer to that question. That was beautiful. I <laughs> Vivian, did you want to speak to that? Oh, great. Good. Is, um, what calculus did, did he use to derive at meat? Um, I, I mean, how did you, like you, you mentioned the chickens and, and the land. I forget the number you said, but how did, how did, what was the math that you did or what was the, what were the inputs, I guess, to get that answer? We, on average, consume 93 eggs a person in this country and 250, uh, I mean, 93 pounds of broiler meat and, uh, and 250 eggs per person per, per year. You take that down to the numbers, the time is that, the 326 million people that will live in this country, take the percentage of those 326 million people that we represent as minorities, each one of us minorities, you know, calculate 5% of that, and then based on our engineering and our poultry production system, which is fully regenerative, then we calculated how many production units and how many per acres per go per production unit, and you get the numbers, it's pretty straightforward. I sat in his class earlier this morning. He had two sessions, and scientifically, and I think economically, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> Certainly seems like it. Um, yeah, great, Christine. I think I want to add to this idea of what a just food system looks like. I know you heard a lot about our organization, and we're not exactly small farmers, but I do want you to extract or hopefully take away what exactly is working for us. And it's not necessarily the system that's going to work for urban communities, but it's a dual access knowledge sharing, which is what has been the most beneficial for us. And that's something that has been mentioned before. So when we're talking about building bridges, who's building those bridges, right? Whose responsibility historically has it been to build those bridges and whose responsibility should it be going forward when we're talking about just food systems? For our organization, a part of that dual building bridges is administration accessing us, our faculty talking to us. So who, I, in order to, I guess, reciprocate the bridges that so many minorities and um, underrepresented people in agriculture have to build and put the effort in, you have to take an um, assessment of your knowledge, skills, and abilities, right? What do you have access to? What do you have knowledge of? and what are your abilities in order for you to then reciprocate that build, bridge building. Because I think that when, when you have access to the numbers, when you have access to the funds, it's easier to build those bridges. But when you don't have access to the numbers, when you don't have access to the funds, when you're on the other side of the food system, building those bridges with limited resources is incredibly difficult. So I think what we're asking for moving forward in a just food system is reciprocated effort in building those bridges with the knowledge, resources, and skills that people have to take an assessment of and willingness to share, which I think is something that people have said. But just to kind of put it into a more tangible sense of like, what does this look like? One, yes, like listen, and in order to change, which is, I think it's amazing that we're having this conversation, but then two, being able to self-reflect and create an assessment of what can I offer and what can I use, what tools and resources do I have to build the bridges? Because the expectation is that we're, we build the bridges, we come up with the numbers, we come up with the funds, we come up with exactly how this system needs to, 
to look like. It, it needs to go both ways for it to be just. Thanks, Christine. Um, do we have some more questions from the from the audience or the panelists, for that matter? Okay, thank you very much. This is really interesting. It's good. I'm taking it all in. Trying to see how we're going to get all of you to really come in to our uh, big number of high school students starting early. We have already have them started from elementary school, so you're not starting from high school. But I think with this beautiful dialogue, a lot of the youth at any age have to sit down and listen and see the path that they have to go. And being able to see you and saying, okay, this is where you are, and then they can see themselves, that's where you're going. So, uh, so with this, you are kind of going to come in into the city and get involved with us? I'll speak for a little bit, and I'd love for, to point this over to Miss Bodie, actually, who is, uh, oh, oh, no, <laughs> I, you got to talk and so forth. So our Junior Manners program um, started three years ago, initially in Gary, Indiana, because we could not convince a local high school to um, let us in, because they already had ag programs, so they don't need more ag programs, even though their students are majority minority and don't really see um, people involved in agriculture who look like them. So we, we had a willing school system, and that was our model um, for most of the junior manners chapters that exist nationally. They are operate out of a high school. So currently, we're looking at other solutions because we've noticed that high school systems aren't really reliable sources of um, students and structure. So in high schools that we've tried to work with in Indy, um, Teachers weren't able to create the time, unfortunately. They didn't have the funds. They didn't have the ability. The high school was under pressure because it was a, um, uh, it was under pressure. And so they weren't willing to let more programs in because that was going to distract their students, um, supposedly. So we would absolutely love, and we're trying to figure out what this looks like when reaching out to um, uh, community centers and community-based organizations, which is what a direction that we're willing to look forward and move to. Um, and so it's the structure that we have for Junior Manners is really unique in that it allows students access to various knowledge and pathways into agriculture. So the main um, pillar is a, an incentive for students to participate to one, get college mentorship, and then two, be able to travel with us. Um, so incentive is key if you're thinking of starting youth programs. What is the incentive? What is the point? Um, it, you want to extract a lesson from that. But yes, we would really love to, if not start a long-term partnership, be able to um, exist in a way that we can help share our story and then learn those stories. A lot of our students um, come from various places and aren't necessarily familiar with um, Indiana and Indianapolis struggles specifically. They know their own struggle, I'm from the East Coast. I know the struggles of food justice on the East Coast in relation to where I am. And so I always learn a lot when listening to and um, hearing about people's stories. So our, our organization is eagerly trying to connect with people. But um, I know she doesn't want to talk, but I would love for Ms. Bodhi to talk about the role. I mean, she has been our pillar in terms of what it means to be an ag educator, because we wouldn't exist. That partnership is mute with, you know, without her. So I think just, I just want to give her a moment. Okay. Um, I work at a, a charter school in Gary, Indiana, and we um, love Purdue because uh, we started with junior master gardeners, I don't even know how many years ago now, eight or nine years ago, and that morphed into us having a junior manners club um, at our school. And I don't know if you know this, Christine, but I was just thinking about, as you were talking, that we've had 
this was our third year participating and we had um, approximately 27 kids who participated in this and three of them have gone on to ag schools, one at Purdue. And um, <clears throat> so it does make an impact and um, what it does for us, you know, what you already do, is that because, you know, we don't have a whole lot of money, our science department isn't the best, and we come with uh, 4-H to do some activities, and we see that we're light years behind um, other schools, and it gives our kids an opportunity to at least be exposed to what they would see in college. and. Um, and gives them the opportunity to do what, what these wonderful students can do and stand up in front of you and speak, you know, clearly. And, um, <clears throat> and it exposes them to agriculture. And a lot of them think it's just farming, but I even if it is just farming, they need to know, uh, because they're gonna be affected by this and their children will be, um, where, you know, food access and, and all of that information. So it, it's, it's, it's been a blessing, really, for us to have uh, Manners uh, involved with us. And, and these wonderful people, first two years, would drive to Gary first year every week <laughs> to work with our students. And, um, you know, we come down here more often now, which is good for, for the students so they can even smell what a college, <laughs> you know, is. And um, so, um, it, you know, uh, we're, we're trying actually to get them more involved in um, uh, learning about food in all its aspects so that they will um, be aware and hopefully um, be missionaries of change when it comes to this issue that we have. Because they do know, you know, even though they eat junk, they do know they shouldn't be eating it. They do know that it's, it's hurting their bodies. They, they know it's killing them, actually. And um, they have no options, or they think they don't. So, but I, this conversation has been wonderful. So thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody I heard in the back say, uh-oh. Um, I'm a professor at Purdue University, and I want to say we do have great students, and I'm very, very proud of our whole Manners team. But I also have been blessed to be here for yesterday afternoon and today, and I know we're not the only university in Indiana that's doing food stuff. So, right, Butler was there at a session yesterday, Goshen was there, um, IU was there, I'm sure I'm leaving out somebody else. Who else? Say it again. Earlham. So my point is this Manners concept is not unique to the land grant university and it's not unique to our ag school. I think those of you that are seeking this sort of interaction and engagement, most universities are looking for an opportunity to engage with real problems and real people and real solutions to try to encourage more people, guess what, to be like them. Right? So if any of you have a, an ambition, I, I don't think, and, and I have to admit, I actually asked our Manners chapter the same question just before uh, an hour ago. And the question is, should the same chapter be trying to do this for all the opportunities in Indiana? And the, someone told me there are limited resources. There's limited time, limited money, limited all that. However, there's some of you that are closer to high school ag programs where you're located, um, our department knows there's about 218 high school agriculture programs in Indiana right now. So they're out there, they're not in the urban centers as much as they are around. So I would challenge you not necessarily to think that this one chapter of Manners at Purdue is going to try to engage, but that you have university students at all of the Ivy Techs, eight, Eight of the Ivy Tech campuses have agricultural programs. Uh, you have Purdue Fort Wayne, you have Purdue Northwest, you know, you have a number of different choices. So my only comment sitting there was, there are a lot of resources and there are a lot of opportunities across the whole state of Indiana. So I would challenge you to think broadly and we're all trying to be 
trying to be more inclusive, but we all have a long ways to go in higher education. So that's enough from me. Uh-oh. Um, to Vivian's point, you had mentioned about um, education having um, uh, elementary through high school. Um, I don't know if you're aware, in Chicago, there is a Chicago School of Agriculture, high, a high school of agriculture, and it is an amazing thing to see. So if you ever get up to Chicago, um, you should go. They will give you a tour, and um, it, it's, it's a, a great model for anybody who wants to do something similar. <clears throat> we uh, actually are doing something on a smaller scale, sort of like what they do. We have goats and chickens on our farm. Uh, on our campus and we we're going to grow vegetables this year um large scale and uh but it's nothing like what's there but it can be done on a small scale <coughs> Thea Bowman Leadership Academy in Gary Indiana Oh Chicago High School of Agriculture Agriculture Sciences yes So we're going to bring the microphone up front in just a second. I, I just wanted to add on because we, we, we work now together, thankfully. But um, I stopped participating in conversations like this a long time ago. Long time ago. And the only reason I'm participating again now is because of the, the way that the question was presented. And it is, what does a just food system look like? And the answer that I would give is there was a, you know, there was a Supreme Court justice once who was asked, you know, I don't know how to define obscenity, but I know it when I see it. And I would say the same thing about food justice. I can't give you an actual definition, and most of the people in this room couldn't probably give a technical definition that would suit everyone, but we all know it when we start to see it. And one of the things that, that we're doing in Gary is to expand opportunities in the field of agriculture by taking principals of the schools in Gary, elementary, middle school, high schools, to the high school in Chicago that Linda was talking about so those principals can see what high school students can do in the field of agriculture so that they can bring ideas back to their schools and show black students in Gary that yes, you can succeed in agriculture and this is something that is for you. And I think that as we talk about food justice and what we know and what we recognize when we see it, there, there has to be that element of taking our children and teaching them as early as we possibly can. So if anyone wants to help, find a school, find a community group. I told someone today, go to the Boys and Girls Club and do a cooking demo, but get children while they're young and show them what is possible in agriculture. And as that happens, the actual injustices that have been done previously will start to rectify themselves. As Vivian was saying before, and this is just a, 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 a small example, okay? My family was part of that group that had land and had it stolen from them in the middle of the night. That's how we ended up in St. Louis. We used to be in Arkansas. But my grandfather could not return to the land that he owned free and clear because if he had gone back, he would have been killed. And so now that land that could still be in our family belongs to someone else, I know not who. But learning about agriculture myself and building the desire in myself and my family to return to the land helps to rectify some of that injustice that my grandfather had to endure. That's food justice. That's bringing someone who was cut off from the food cycle back into it. Now, will I ever regain what was stolen from my grandfather? No. But will I have something different to pass on and bring more black people back into the field of working with the land? Absolutely. And the good news is that everybody in this room who has a desire to do that can find a group and volunteer and teach our children. So someone else can take the mic. Hi, oh my God, I'm so excited. Um, 
So it's kind of a two-part question. I entered Nassau Brown County, Indiana, and wanted to intervene in the in the elementary school systems with providing them with local farm food. So actually cutting into that corporate kind of long-standing contracts that they have with the food system. Surprise, it didn't work. So I guess that's a lot of what I'm talking about. So as a small farmer, I'm thinking I want to get into elementary schools and do something fun and incentive, but really I want to have a long-standing contract with other farmers to serve the food literally to the students. And I'm just wondering, do you know what, who I have to harass to make that possible? Because when I grew up, my grandfather traded everything. He traded his meat, his e everything. We would go in the grocery store and didn't pay anything because he had this association with community. And I think when you're in elementary school and you get this food, question mark, question mark, if it's food, then you don't associate where it's coming from. And so I'm hoping that I can intervene in that system and in these long-standing contracts with GFS and all these corporations and actually reinvest in that experience for students. Because I can come in and talk all day about the importance of tomatoes, but if they're getting served my tomatoes and eating them every day, I feel that that's more impactful. You're not saying anything new because I'm in, New York, I'm in New York City and you don't know how long farmers have been trying to get into the Board of Education. It is political. Up and down, there are rules and regulation. Big Ag has his throat on the school system and on the criminal justice system because there's so many farmers, especially small farmers, that can make a living and make a mint if they can just get into the correction facilities, the prisons, and the schools. But you got big ag. You got these big companies that lobby that prevent small farmers. So it's an uphill battle because we're, uh, I, I, mean, I can only speak for New York State, of farmers trying to get in now. We have a governor and we also have the Secretary of Agriculture that is trying to slowly, at least bring in apples. Apples and carrots are starting to come in. What you're also seeing is that within New York City, we have school gardens for the first time. Again, getting schools to understand, first of all, where food comes from and then taking that food and using it as part of the meal. But still, we got a long way to go because majority of the schools in New York City get their food from big corporations that they have to heat up in a microwave. They have taken the ovens out. And so now this is what the food system. So that's what we're up, up against. So I would just suggest that, again, you're just one person, but you've got to get the help of so many farmers, urban, rural, small, big, to be able to break that. It, that's, that's politics to break that poli to break it so that small farmers who need to make a living can go into those two big operation schools in prison and the more people that can help her and other farmers together to go before the I don't know who your governor is but, but I mean but that's how it is in order to but you got those big corporations you got the Cargills you got the you got these big corporations that are controlling the food system in such a way and it's going to really take a huge movement. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I will say, I know, I was just hearing that the Indiana Grown Department or program, yeah, they're doing a survey about farm to school right now and so they want to ID all the schools in the state that want farmers coming in and all the farmers who want to be supplying schools. So they're trying to match make and that is funded through the state, so there's some political will, apparently. Heather Tallman. Okay, beauty. All right, last question, I think. Okay. Uh, it's just a quick question. I was wondering, it kind of ties into this as well. I was just wondering if there's anyone in the room that um, can tell me, like, if there, so we all know that schools have a lot of standards now, and it's really hard to work around those 
as far as science goes. So um, we talked a little bit about having agricultural programs in uh, high schools and elementary schools. I was wondering if anyone has um, any resources of like, how can we match standards to agricultural education so that way we can kind of work around it? Um, Cause I'm really interested in this conversation and I think it can really go somewhere, but we, we first need to know how can teachers have the um, autonomy to work around these standards in order to teach agriculture in the schools. Oh, I want to know where. No, I'm sorry. It's got passed to me in the back corner. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so uh, I'm Dr. Orvis. I work with Dr. Russell back here at Purdue. Um, but we have standards. Sorry, we have standards. We have academic standards for the ag program and for in, in science as well that are matched. But that's one of the things that, that we can potentially help you with. And, and as you said as well, there's, it's matched. The junior master garden program that that some of you have tossed around it's matched so um you can let me know i can give you a card we can get connected would anybody on the panel like to say anything to to finish up did we miss i mean there's worlds more to say but um do you want to Um, I, well, um, I, I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm not as well versed in this topic as many of you are who are in it, but what I can say from what I've deduced from hearing a lot of the questions and, um, just a lot of things I've learned through personal experience, uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to talk about resources for a moment is the fact that even though as individuals, we may not always take the time to think about the power that we have individually we are powerful individuals if you really are looking for resources and it may not be there you can make yourself a resource for example for myself i noticed how there aren't many say hair care products for black men on the market i could just be like m m many of the other people was like okay there's something out there for me it is what it is Whereas I took the time to educate myself and look into different things to make myself a resource so something that's not there, I can stand in that spot and be the thing that I saw that wasn't there. And so what I can say for everybody else is if there's something that you don't see that's there or there's somewhere that you want to go or reach out to, it's great to link with other people to do that. But at the same time, we have to be the change that we want to see. It all starts with us and then as you develop your vision and you get more foundation to your vision, other people see your vision and invest in your vision. And that's how change will be made in the broader, on, on a broader scale so we can ultimately achieve the just food system that we were, that we were talking about earlier.